Step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. The first part implies having had a spiritual awakening as the result. It doesn't say a result. It says the result of these steps. The second part is we try to carry this message to alcoholics. And the third part is to practice these principles in all our affairs. You see, what I've discovered is that the real work is step 12. You see, what the steps do is they prepare me to do the real work. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's, an, there's a chapter, chapter 7, beginning on page 89, which is entirely devoted to working with others. Numerous times through the years I've heard people say, you know, I really wish we had some literature on sponsorship. We have a whole chapter on sponsorship. It's called Working with Others. What I love about this chapter is that the authors give me specific, clear-cut directions. What to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do, when to do it, when not to do it. If you haven't read this chapter, I would strongly encourage you to do so. We're going to uh, cover some of the highlights of this. Let's start with uh, page 89, paragraph 1. Page 89, paragraph 1. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. So maybe it's essential that I work with other people. Page 90, paragraph 1. Page 90, paragraph 1. When you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. In other words, let him talk. Let her talk. Find out who it is you're dealing with. What this does for me is gives me some perspective. Which direction to take. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. It's a waste of time to work with someone who doesn't, who's not willing to work with you. Because when I do that, I'm depriving another alcoholic and I am depriving me. Okay, paragraph 2, page 90. If there is any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him, usually his wife. Get an idea of his behavior, his problems, his background, the seriousness of his condition, and his religious leanings. You need this information to put yourself in his place, to see how you would like him to approach you if the tables were turned. Once again, we want to get as much information as we can about the person. Next paragraph, six lines down. Then let his family... Or a friend asks him if he wants to quit for good and if he would go to any extreme to do so. How many people in here want to quit for good? Are you willing to go to any extreme to do so? Page 91, paragraph 3. Page 91, paragraph 3. See your man alone, if possible, at first engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If, he's, if we're encouraging him to speak, that means we're going to listen. We're not going to sit down and preach to the person and tell him, this is what you need to do. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. You will thus get a better idea of how you ought to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit. This is very important. But say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. If he is in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you, being careful not to moralize or lecture. If his mood is light, tell him human stories of your escapades. Get him to tell some of his. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggle you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. If you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. Show him from your own experience. That's what we stick to, our own experience. How the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book. 
unless he has seen it and wishes to discuss it. And be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusion. So when I work with new guys, I go into it not assuming that they're alcoholic. What I do is I go into it giving them the dignity of finding the truth about their experience. Next paragraph, page 92, which is paragraph 2. Continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of body and mind which accompany it. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. That's why I'm there to share my experience, not my opinions, not my ideas, not what church he should go to, who he should be married to or not be married to, what job he should have. That's, that's none of my business. Page 93, third line from the top. Now, notice, before we read this, up to this point, basically all we've done is listen. I'm swapping experiences with him. I'm sharing some of my, my mental inconsistencies, the mental obsession, some of the things that occurred to me when I was drinking. And then they tell us this, third line from the top of page 93. Tell me exactly what happened to you. Stress the spiritual feature freely. So, see, up to this point, I'm not going to even mention it. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. So you see, his understanding of God doesn't have to make sense to me. What's most important is that it makes sense to him. The main thing is that he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. Okay, turn to page 95, paragraph 2. Page 95, paragraph 2. If he is not interested in your solution, if he expects you to act only as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. I'm not a banker. I'm not a hotel. I'm there to share my experience, strength, and hope with him. Page 96, paragraph 1. Page 96, paragraph 1. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. Sounds like Bill Wilson. First 12 guys that he worked with didn't stay sober. He was disappointed. He went back to his wife, Lois, and said, you know, I've been talking to these drunks and none of them are staying sober. She said, well, you are. So you see, when I work with others, it does not matter whether they stay sober. It does not matter if they follow through. It does not matter if they call. If, they don't want, if they're not willing to work with me, I find another person. Notice also, it doesn't say anywhere in this book, to my knowledge, that I go to meetings and I kick back and I wait for the newcomer to come to me. Where would this program be if Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob did that? If they sat home and said, you know, nope, the phone hasn't rang. They sought them out. Have you ever noticed newcomers in meetings raising their hands and saying, Hi, uh, my name's John, I'm an alcoholic, and I need a sponsor. I need to work with somebody. You know what I do when they ask for, are there any other A announcements? I raise my hand. My hand. Hi, I'm Paul, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I need to work with somebody and take them through the steps. So if there's anyone here that needs to be taken through the steps, please see me after the meeting. I have a responsibility to be available to the newcomer. That means I'm not going to wait for them to come to me. I'm simply sharing with you what I was taught to do by my first sponsor. So when I'm at a meeting, there might be ten people there that I want to hug from that I'm, that I'm close to. But if there are newcomers there and they stand up, I'm going to ask them, do you have a sponsor? And if they say no, I don't ask them if they want one. That's, I'm telling you, that's what my book says. I don't ask them if they want a sponsor. I sign myself. I say, well, you've got one now. I'm your sponsor. Well, what if I don't want you to be my sponsor? Well, then go get another one. But the point is, I'm taking responsibility for carrying the message of hope to the alcoholic. Hey, let's go grab some coffee. You open to doing that? Then we sit down, and I do as, as outlined in this book. Sit down and get more information from the person. Find out who it is I'm dealing with. See, I don't know about the rest of you. I want to stay sober. I want to be free. I cannot be free by not working with others. 
My 20 years of sobriety will not keep me sober. Sobriety does not keep me sober. That's, that's simply a gift. That gift isn't going to keep me sober. Remember, I'm a real alcoholic. I can't survive on the food I received yesterday. I need new spiritual food today. And I can't rely on what I did yesterday to maintain what I'm experiencing today. Here's something to consider. What would happen to AA if everybody in AA did sobriety the way you're doing it today? What would happen to AA if everybody in AA was doing sobriety the way you're doing it today? I have a responsibility when I go to meetings today to carry a message of hope. What that means is this. I am not there to talk about my problems. That's what sponsors are for. That's what coffee before the meeting, coffee after the meeting is for. Stop and think about it. You go to a meeting, you dump, you whine, you complain, you got some new person in there. Do you think that person wants to come back? The point I'm trying to make is this. Those of us that have gone through the steps and have had a spiritual awakening, we have a responsibility to carry hope to the meetings. So when that newcomer comes in and he hears hope, he, want, he or she wants to return to that meeting. I'm coming back to this meeting. I heard a lot of hope. Page 97, paragraph 1, line 2. Page 97, paragraph 1, line 2. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act a good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights' sleep, great interference with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. So ask yourself, do I have a foundation stone? Am I working with others? Am I helping other people? Page 98, paragraph 1, line 8. Page 98, paragraph 1, line 8. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no job. We simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence on God. My sobriety is not contingent on my sponsor. It's not dependent on him. It's important that I have one. It's important that I maintain contact with him. Bring the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. Last line on page 99. Last line on page 99. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. Notice it does not say that it is dependent on God. It is dependent upon his relationship. Now, this is where prayer meditation comes back in. If I'm going to have a relationship with someone, that assumes that I'm going to spend time with them. Is that correct? So if I'm going to have a relationship with my friend Michael here, that means I need to spend time with him. I need to talk to him, and I need to listen. A relationship isn't where I'm doing all the talking. That's not a relationship. A relationship involves talking and listening. Paragraph 1, page 100. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. If I persist. Remarkable. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. Page 102. Page 102, paragraph 2. Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. So if I'm doing the work, which is working with others, I'm carrying the message, not the mess, not my opinions, not my ideas. What I've learned as a result of going through these steps on a repeated basis and continuing to work with others, that when I sponsor someone, I have only three responsibilities, only three. Take them through the 12 steps. Tell them the truth and love them. To love them simply means let them be right where they are. It's important for me to let the guys I sponsor to let them struggle. I'm not there to repair their struggles. 
which reminds me of a story of a little boy who goes out to the woods and he sees a butterfly in a cocoon struggling to get out. He decides to help the butterfly. So he pulls out his pocket knife and he, and he opens up the cocoon so the butterfly can get all the way out. The butterfly is able to get all the way out of the cocoon and then he falls to the ground and dies. The little boy runs home and he asks his father, he says, Daddy, Daddy, I tried to help this butterfly and he died. What happened? And the father says, well, son, you know, that butterfly needed to struggle so it could develop the strength so it could fly. I have no desire to get in the middle of someone's experience. I take the person through the steps. It's not my job to continually to go back and hound them and remind them, are you doing those amends? That's not my job. This is what my sponsor did for me. He sat me down. Basically, he did what I was outlined in this book, and he got a good idea of what I would, you know, what my drinking and, of course, my using was, was like at the time. And, and he asked me a couple of simple questions. He said, are you willing to go to any length to have a spiritual experience? I said, yeah. He said, are you willing to do everything I ask you to do with no debate? Ooh. He said, well, are you willing to consider that uh, my judgment about your life is infinitely better than yours? <laughs> After all, I've been bouncing in and out of AA for 12 years. Yeah, but you don't understand. I've been around these rooms for a long time. That was the problem. I'd been around. I had not been in it. And you could always you could always spot me in a meeting. You could tell I was a relapser and you could tell that I was operating on self-will because I would say things like, yeah, I put together X amount of sobriety. That was the problem. I put it together. (laughs) I said, yeah, but I've been around these rooms for a long time. He said, no, wait a minute. He said, you have absolutely nothing we want. You have absolutely nothing to offer us. What do you have to offer us? Do you have any experience on living a spiritual way of life? Well, you know, I know something about spiritual living. You know, and it says, that, and I said, yeah, he said, but wait a minute, do you have any experience? No. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I want you to go to meetings and I want you to shut up and don't talk. Because you have nothing to offer until you go through all 12 steps and you have a spiritual awakening. Then you will have something to offer. He's, by the way, he said, all that drinking you did, you know, and putting those needles in your arms and, and carrying those weapons and all that. He said, if we need any help in that area, we'll call on you. In the meantime, just go to meetings and listen. I'll tell you, it was tough because, you know, I had some great ideas and you people needed to hear about them. And I had a lot of ideas. But the point is, in the 12 years I was bouncing in and out of the rooms, I was going around sharing opinions on experiences I never had. You start talking about the fourth step, I'd share, yeah, this is what I think about the fourth step. I had no experience with it. It's like you coming up to me and trying to tell me about bungee jumping. You don't have a clue. You have no experience with it. You have, ex- you have experience in an area. If you have experience with making amends, I'm going to come to you and ask you. If you have experience with repairing relationships, with taking care of finances, etc., etc., I'm going to go to you. I'm going to seek you out. What he did is he took me through those steps really quick, less than six weeks, and he cut me loose. said, okay, I want you to start working with others. My, I, was, I was terrified. I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to kill someone. <laughs> no, I'm not. I had an experience. I had a spiritual awakening. And I got a lot of flack from people saying, you haven't been sober long enough. Where, where does it say that in our book that we have to be sober one year before we start sponsoring others? Bill Wilson wasn't sober a year. Dr. Bob wasn't so we're here when he started carrying the message. The only prerequisite is that I have gone through all 12 steps and I've had a spiritual awakening. Now I have something to offer. Now I have the message. And I've had experience with sharing the mess. And it was not helpful. Sharing your experience and the solution in this book with another suffering alcoholic, you will not want to miss. Attempt to convey to you the excitement and the joy and the jubilation of of, of sharing with another alcoholic is hard to convey if you haven't had the experience. Only the people who have done it will truly understand what it's like. It's an absolute joy to work with other alcoholics. Now, my mind doesn't always say that. I mean, I've sponsored guys through the years who... You know, who are like emotional vampires, the kind of person you put in your car and you're driving down the street and the street lights dim every time you drive under them. You know, you say, oh, God, I don't want to spend time with him. 
because I'm going to go there and I'm going to have to listen to all this whining, and I'm going to have to turn around and call my sponsor and whine about his whining, which is something we all do. You know, and I'm on the way there, and I'm thinking, geez, I want to be with this guy. You know, he's, he's in victim posture, and he's going to whine. He's going to start talking about this. And, yeah, I'll look at my watch and think I'm going to miss that game. I'm going to have to get the score. You know, I'm, I'm going to miss out on that. You know, and I get there, and invariably, sometime in the middle of doing the step work, something magical happens. And I start to have gratitude, and I'm thankful. And spontaneously, this prayer goes off in my head that says, Thank you, God. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And, and I walk away, and my, my cup is full. And then next week, I go through it all over again, you know. <laughs> but it's from the experience. So, you see, it doesn't matter what my mind tells me. It's from the experience of the transformation that I experience as a result of continuing to work with others. You see, the newcomer is the lifeblood, and the old-timer is the heart. And neither one can survive without the other. I need the newcomer, and the newcomer needs the old-timer. So, you see, we're in this thing together. kind of reminds me of an experience that I had watching uh, the Discovery Channel. They had these buffalo. These, it was in Africa, these, these African buffalo. And, and they were all, this herd of them was going through a pasture. And on the perimeter of the pasture were these lions. And the lions were just laying there, not, not even moving a muscle. And then all of a sudden, one of the buffalo left the herd. And immediately the lions pounced on him and killed him. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's just like AA. When I stick with the herd, I'm okay. But the moment I leave the herd, I'm dead meat. I'd like to welcome all of you to the fourth dimension. Before we close tonight, there are a couple of things that we're going to go over. Why don't you pull out your questionnaire? that we reviewed in our first session. These were questions on beliefs in AA that we were being asked to answer true or false before and after our step work. The purpose of this is to see if there was any change in, in what you believe. It's entitled Questions on Beliefs in AA. Okay, true or false? If we are planning to stop drinking, all we have to do is not drink one day at a time. True or false? False. false. On page 33, it says if we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. Next one. Once I take the steps, I will have a partnership with my higher power. False. Look what it says on page 62 and 63. Let's take a look. He's telling me on page 62 and 63 that he's a principal and I'm his agent. Does that sound like a partnership? 63, they're telling me that I'm going to have a new employer. Does that sound like a partnership? If he has all the power, does that sound like a partnership? Nope. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker? God is my co-pilot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. God is my co-pilot. If God's my co-pilot, who's driving the car? <laughs> who's in charge? <laughs> Me. Uh oh, look out. <laughs> Okay, oh boy. Next one. Once I fully understand God, I will be free from my alcoholism. False. Wonder why. Let's see what it says in the book. Can I fully understand God? No. It's impossible, isn't it? For me to, under to fully understand God is to be God. I still don't understand God. Okay. The big book is the only book I need to read. We just read that on page 87, where the authors are suggesting that we read outside literature. Next one. It is not necessary to do step four more than once. True or false? What do you think? False. Page 71. If you have already made a decision, that's step three, 
and an inventory of your grosser handicaps. That's step four. You have made a good beginning. It doesn't say we're finished. There's no way I'm going to uncover everything I need to uncover that blocks me from God in one inventory. We can win the confidence of another alcoholic by relating to their experiences. Let me read it again. We can win the confidence of another alcoholic by relating to their experiences. What do you think? True or false? Hmm? What do you think? They have to relate to our experience? Let's see what the book says. Page 18, if you'd like to know where, where the answer to this is. In the italicized part, it says, But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, they're talking about what? The spiritual solution. Who is properly armed with facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. So you see, I have to have had found a solution and being properly armed with facts about myself. Next one. Our, our purpose in sobriety is to get back into the mainstream of life. True or false? What is our, what is our purpose? Hmm? Yeah. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. That's on page 77. Next one. There are many different ways you can work this program. True or false? False. It's really clear on page uh, 58. The very first thing we hear and how it works in every single meeting. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Path doesn't have an S on it. Next one. Our sobriety is the greatest possession. What do you think? Is our sobriety our greatest possession? Hmm? Let me share with, what, share with you what it says on page 124. The alcoholic's past thus becomes the principal asset of the family and frequently it is almost the only one. Cling to the thought that in God's hands, the dark past is the great possession you have. Wow, the key to life and happiness for others. So my greatest possession is my past. It's not my sobriety. The authors of the big book encourage us to drink. True or false? What do you think? Page 31. Let's see what the, what the authors say. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. That sounds like an encouragement to me. They're encouraging me to go out and try some controlled drinking. See, their authors are trying to find out, are you really an alcoholic? Do you really have no power? Okay. Next one. Our main focus needs to be on the alcoholic, not on their family. True or false? Our main focus needs to be on the alcoholic, not on their family. Let's see what it says in the big book. On page 97, it says, Though an alcoholic does not respond, there is no reason why you should neglect his family. You should continue to be friendly to them. The family should be offered your way of life. We don't hear enough of this in meetings. I've had many opportunities in sobriety to go out and work with the family. When the alcoholic wasn't willing to seek a solution. So we need to be willing to offer that to the family as well. Next one. It takes a long time to recover from alcoholism. Maybe it's true. What do you think? It takes a long time to recover from alcoholism. If it took a long time, how come it didn't take Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson very long? Let's see what the book says on page 118. We do not like the thought that the contents of a book or the work of another alcoholic has accomplished in a few weeks that for which we struggled for years. Another quote, page 158. See what it says over here. On the third day, 
The lawyer gave his life to the care and direction of his creator and said he was perfectly willing to do anything necessary. His wife came scarcely daring to be hopeful, though she thought she saw something different about her husband already. Wow, he had begun to have a spiritual experience. You in this workshop have had personal experience in a matter of four weeks. You've gone through all the 12 steps. Okay. The next one. The steps are not required. They are suggested. That's a tricky one, isn't it? Somebody said true. Well, it does say in chapter 5 that uh, the the steps are suggested, correct? Let's see what it says in another place in the book, page 25. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. So if I'm going to succeed... The steps are required for me. They are not suggested. Reminds me of a story this guy was telling. He was telling me about a friend of his who conducted skydiving. And in his hangar, he had all these parachutes hanging on the wall with a big sign on the top of it pointing to the the ripcord ring saying, This cord, this ring is but suggested when you are up there. Now, is our life any less important than the person who's skydiving and has a ring that they can... It's only suggested that they pull it. Right? For this alcoholic, the steps are required, according to my own experience and the experience of the authors in this book. Going The next one, going to meetings and not drinking is vital to our recovery. What do you think? Going to meetings and not drinking is vital to our recovery. Let's see what it says in Roman numeral 17. Roman numeral 17. It also indicated that strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital to permanent recovery. That's at the top of Roman numeral 17, which is XVII, where the author state, it also indicated that strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital to permanent recovery. That would, in the fourth edition, that would be two later pages. The last one, our common suffering is what holds us together. True or false? What do you think? Let's see what the authors say. It says our common suffering is what holds us together. Let's see what it says in the book on page 17. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the power of cement which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. In other words, our suffering is not what binds us together. Our suffering is what brings us together. What holds us together is the solution. Every single person in this room who has completed the 12 steps, regardless of how long you've been sober, you are now in a position to take somebody else through the steps. If you're anything like me, when my sponsor first took me through the steps, he cut me loose said, okay, now go out there and find somebody to work with. What do you mean, find somebody to work with? I was afraid I was going to kill somebody. But you see, I had experience. I had gone through the steps. I would go to meetings, and, and I had got a lot of flack from people telling me, you haven't been sober long enough. Where does it say in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I have to be sober X amount of time in order to carry the message of hope? It doesn't say that in the book. Once again, if it's not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it is not Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm here to tell each and every one of you that have completed the steps, you are the ones. You are the torchbearers of this program. 
You are the lifeblood. The old timer is the heart. Neither one can survive without the other. We're depending on you to carry the message of hope to the new person. To carry the message of hope back to your meetings. To get active with sponsoring people. So I'm encouraging every single person in this room to come back next week for a new cycle of the Big Book Workshop. You are in a position. You are qualified to do so. You have had a spiritual experience. Has the compulsion to drink been removed for you? You're nodding yes. That means you are in a position to do so. You can't do this wrong. There is no sponsor school. You know how you learn to be a sponsor? By being one. There is no sponsor school. You don't, well, I need to wait until I'm sober a year. Really? Now, what if Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson did that? What if Bill Wilson carried the message to Dr. Bob? Dr. Bob said, how long have you been sober? He didn't care. He had a message of hope. God made a deal with me. He separated me from alcohol as a result of going through the steps. And this was the deal. Paul, I guarantee you will never, ever have to drink again and you'll never have to live the way you were living before. And all I ask is that you carry this message of hope to another alcoholic. That's a smoking deal. For an alcoholic like me, that's a sw- this is. I'm telling you, this is the best game in town right here. Nobody in this room has to ever drink again, and you don't ever have to live the way you were living before, if you don't want to. I want to thank each and every one of you, and I want to thank you for allowing me to be of service. And I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you next Sunday for a new cycle of the Big Book Workshop, so that you can come here and be of service to the new person who wants to be taken through the steps as outlined in this book, so they too can have freedom. God bless you and thank you very much.